Matthew chapter 13, verse 40, verse 44. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Tonight we're talking about um, the parable of the hidden treasure. As it was in just one verse, but I think it's, there's a lot of rich material here. <clears throat> the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in joy he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. And may God add his blessings to the reading of the word. And one of the things we need to realize when we take a look at this is that the parable of the the, tre- the bearing of treasures was a com- was a common activity uh, in Israel. It was something that, that people did, and and you might ask yourself why. Well, one of the first things is there was no safe, nearly no safe place that a person could deposit their wealth. You know, they didn't have banks with safety deposit vaults, and they didn't have. You know, they couldn't buy government bonds and things of that nature like we can do today with it. You know, today we can safely, you know, protect, you know, at least a portion of our wealth. But in those days, there was no way to do it. In fact, some of you might have remembered some of your forebears burying money, you know, someplace to hide it because they didn't trust the banks. You know, I've certainly heard those stories myself. In fact, at our old home place where I'm down in Christmas, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some money that was buried around there somewhere uh, you know, this, that was never recovered. But it was a common thing for people to do that. You know, and another thing was the frequency of war. Uh, if you go back and look in the book of Judges, you know, you'll see that they, you know, they, would have, they would have constantly being people raiding from other nations trying to take away their possessions and their wealth. And so as a result, burying treasure was something that, that was quite common. Uh, so what happened was this man was looking in his field and he found this treasure. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, why did the man hide, after he found it, why did he hide it? Well, there's a couple of good reasons for that. First of all, according to Jewish civil law, anyone buying a field is entitled to, was entitled to whatever was in the field. <clears throat> so when he reburied it, and he went and he bought the field. Once he bought that field, he could go and he could reclaim that treasure. It was now re- legally his. He didn't have to worry about, about it anymore. But beyond that, he probably reburied it to protect it from thieves. You know, that was, that was a problem, as we mentioned, the frequency of war, the raiders coming in from other nations, but also thieves locally would try to come in and steal. I mean, how many of you have home security systems now? You know, that, that's, you know, there was a time when you left your door unlocked. If somebody did steal something, you pretty much knew who the thief in the community was. You'd go see them. You know, but nowadays people are mobile. And as a result, we have home security systems. We have all kinds of things in place trying, trying to protect it. But also another thing was to keep the discovery secret. You see, he had, he had to go buy the field before he could, before he could uh, claim, legally claim the possession of the treasure. You know, if the word got out that there was treasure in his field, somebody else might have tried to go get in ahead of him and buy the field. You know, today we see this kind of thing in the stock market. We call it insider trading, don't we? You know, you hear about that all the time. In fact, I got a website that we looked at called Finviz. Pretty neat website. And one of the things it will show you on the stock is a percentage of insider trading. You know, what what percentage of people actually in the company own stock in the company. Uh, another thing that I'll show you is any unusual activity in that area. So, you know, the idea being that, that, that he was trying to protect something precious that he found. And he wanted to be able to legally claim that which he found. Something that was so important to him. Well, now let's ask ourselves, you know, what, what does this mean? Well, there's, there's several interpretations of this parable. Let's go through and talk about each and every one of them individually. You know, the first is, is that it is Jesus who finds the treasure. And then he sells everything and he buys the field. Um, what we've, so what we find here is that the treasure would thus be, could, would either be Israel, which was God's unique possession, or it was believers. You know, that, was, that is one of the interpretations. In Exodus 19.15, there's kind of some evidence of this. It says, now if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession. 
out of all the peoples, although the whole, although the whole earth is mine. A couple of important things let's see there. First of all, God, God kind of puts a proviso in there, a provision. You've got to keep the covenant. If you keep the covenant, you're going to be my own unique possession out of all the peoples in the earth. And he, then, he, then he adds another one. Although the whole earth is mine. It's important for us to remember that God owns everything. You know, that's always my first rule of, um, of stewardship. God owns everything. He created it. It's His. He can do with it whatever He wants to. So as a result, we need to always keep that in mind when we look at our own wealth. That even though we may have worked for it, even though we may have inherited, who knows? Whatever the case is, ultimately it belongs to God. Everything that we, he, we have belongs to Him. You know, so the idea being that Jesus gave up everything to save his people. Okay, and, and, and the problem, it, but there's a problem with this. See, Jesus did not happen upon Israel by accident, did he? You know, his coming was planned. We, we, we see that in Scripture repeatedly. You know, how many prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus came as a baby? You know, we're starting to, we're, it's funny, we're, you know, kind of are starting to turn now. The days are starting to get shorter. Today will be a minute shorter than yesterday. Uh, you know, we're heading towards Christmas, believe it or not. You know, it's uh, Hallmark Channel is showing Christmas, you know, things in July. I actually put a devotional out the other day. You know, used a Christmas verse and made mention of that. It was unusual to do it. But, you know, the idea being that, that Jesus, when he came, that was planned. You know, it wasn't something that was an accident. It wasn't haphazard. See, you know, Jesus also, when he came, he didn't rejoice over Israel. He mourned over Israel instead. We find in Matthew 23, 37, where he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You know, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he came to Israel and he presented himself to Israel as, as their Messiah, as their Savior, but he was rejected. And, 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 he, and here he mourns over Israel. He's sad that Israel didn't repent. He's sad that he, that he sent the prophets to them, and, and yet they would not repent time after time after time. You know, this morning I just finished reading Lamentations in my daily Bible study. I read Jeremiah before that. Jeremiah was the prophet, the great prophet over, in, over Judah and in Jerusalem whenever they rebelled against, um, whenever they chose to rebel against God. You know, and, and that's sad, and that's when the nation fell. That's when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and took it and drove them into captivity. It wasn't what God wanted, but that was the result of their sin. And now Jesus is presenting himself as their Messiah and he knows they're going to reject him, reject him again and he's mourning over Israel. So, you know, but this, then there is another interpretation which contends the treasure represents the concealed nature of the kingdom. Take a look at some verses in chapter 14, those of you who still got your Bible. Verse 11, you know, we read it and it tells us his head was brought on a platter. Whoops, I'm in the wrong, I'm in the right one. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I'm in the wrong chapter. There we go. Let's go over here. Okay, here we go. It says, He answered, Because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given you to know, but it, it has not been given to them. Then if you read in verse 16, he says, Blessed are your eyes because they do see, and your ears because they do hear. And then verse 17, it continues, For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see the things you see, but didn't hear them to hear the things you hear, but didn't hear them. So as a result, what we find here is, is we find that, you know, it, it, this according to the second interpretation, this uh, represents the concealed nature of the kingdom. See, in this view, the parable teaches how an individual is willing to sacrifice everything to inherit to, or to obtain the treasure of the kingdom. Um, now, a third interpretation really combines the preceding two views. It points out that Christ gave up his all to redeem and establish the kingdom. That's true, isn't it? <clears throat> you know, that's true. Uh, his disciples also must give up all if they continue to be members of the kingdom and stay under God's rules. And indeed, didn't they give up everything? 
We know they did. I mean, you know, he called called the fishermen from their from their business. They had people working for them. Obviously, they had some degree of success there. Peter even said one time, "Lo, we have given up everything to follow you." So, so there's certainly some truth to that interpretation. Let's turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter two, verses five to eight. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. <clears throat> Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had become as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. So what we find when we read this verse is that Jesus existing in the form of God. Jesus was God. He's God made man. And instead, he humbled himself and became a person. So as a result, we certainly see that, God, that Jesus did humble himself, that, that he became, um, became a servant, and likewise, he called his disciples to give up everything. Now, we also see in John 17, 5, where Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, now, Father, glorify me with that, in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. He's, he's professing there, I'm, I'm God. I was there before the world existed. I was with you, Father. Now, glorify me in your presence once again. You know, think about what it would have been like to have been to, for Jesus, God, to become a human being to live in this sinful world, to take our sins upon him on the cross, and to die for us, and then be resurrected. I mean, that, that had to, he'd give up a lot. How many of us would be willing to give up something like that, have something wonderful and powerful, and give it all up and walk away from it? And yes, that's what he did. In Luke 14, 33, it says, In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all he possesses cannot be my disciple. He was... They give up everything. As I said, you had the fishermen. They walked away from their business. You had the tax collector. You know, he walked away from that business. That was pretty good business. He was you know, basically given a license to make money. Uh, and yet they all walked away from the Apostle Paul. He, you know, he, said, he said that he counted it all as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he had quite an extensive resume. So what we find here, we have to ask her a question. Which one of these is right? Well, let's look at the first of all, let's recognize something. We have to recognize that this parable was for the specific benefit of the disciples. <clears throat> Why? Because this is the group that was going to experience deprivation and even death for the cause of Christ. You know, think about it. Of the disciples, they were all killed. They were all put to death except the apostle John. Church tradition tells us, tells us that he died of old age. <clears throat> but look where he was when he wrote the book of Revelation. He was in exile in the Isle of Patmos. <clears throat> it wasn't exactly a job with a lot of benefits. There, you know, the golden parachute was eternity. You know, when they would be in the presence of the Lord. Between while they were on earth, there was suffering, there was hardship, there was pain, and yes, there was death. And they had to give up everything they had for the cause of Christ. <clears throat> so, what do we find about this man in the field? Well, he's an ordinary man. <clears throat> you know, it's been interesting. You, you, I've, I've read speculations by people that he was a, a worker. He was plowing in the field. You know, that, that he perhaps was someone who was just walking through the field. You know, I mean, there's any number of things could have been a possibility. You know, I know from my own experience, we used to have an Indian mound on our, on our farm. And uh, whenever we'd diss the orange grove or it would rain, you would go out and you would look for arrowheads and pottery and stuff because, you know, it would suddenly be exposed. Had some cousins that lived up in Georgia, up around Leslie, Georgia, and they got buckets full of arrowheads that they found out in the fields after they plowed. So, you know, obviously there's these, these things that were hidden, but this guy was out in the field. He may have been in that, if he was plowing, he may have been in that field all the time and just suddenly you know discovered it i mean how, how often 
Have you been someplace you've been many times and see something new for the first time? The old, I've never noticed that before. Well, you know, look at that. Yeah, I've done it. I'm sure we all probably have, and that certainly seems to be the case. Uh, but what we do know uh, is that we don't know why he was in the field, but we do know the fact that he was there. See, the man finding the, the treasure really seems to have been an accident. You know, he didn't get up that morning and say, yes, today I'm going to go find that treasure that is in the field. No, he was in the field, and oh, wait a minute, what's this? You know, as I said before, we've probably all done something like that at some point found some, something of that nature. So what we find here is the field, and certainly in my mind, represents the world. And I don't do that just because I think that, but I think there's some good evidence of that. John 4.35, Jesus made a statement that I think applies to this situation. He said, don't you say there are still four more months, and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields, because they are ready for the harvest. You know, the, the world, the field, the field that we're in, outside these church doors, when we pull out of the parking lot, that's the field right there. That's the world, and, it, and it's white for the harvest. So as a result, there's a constant challenge. What's interesting is others had probably walked in the field, and yet they didn't find it. You know, you know think about it. We have people throughout the world that, that, that are there, but they didn't find it. We find it. what happens is that for some reason they were blinded to it. And even this man was blinded to it till a certain time. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, Satan blinds the mind of unbelievers so that Jesus is hidden from them. You know, otherwise, if it wasn't for him doing that, they would all, people, everyone would come to Christ. But he blinds them. How does he do it? He, he does it through you know, world philosophies. He, he does it through, you know, through idolatry. You know, let's face it, people, when we, if we're not careful, we can have idols in our lives. You know, idols can be a lot of forms. Idols can be money. Idols can be drugs. Idols can be power. Idols can be you know, fame and fortune. And we can go on and on and on. You ever seen somebody made their, themselves an idol? You know, what, is God, what does Paul say? In the last day, people shall be lovers of self, shall they not? So as a result, we're bl people are blinded to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what Satan does because he knows that he has to do that. See, the treasure, on the other hand, is Jesus Christ. You see, in Him, in Him, we have the treasure, a great abundance of treasure. You know, and there will be a portion for each and every single one of us. Remember what we said earlier. What does God own? Everything. He owns it all. In John 1.16, it says, Indeed, we, all, we have all received grace and grace upon grace from His fullness. He has just shown so much grace to us. So that's one treasure we have. We have, the, we have in Jesus, we have the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. You don't think so? Open up the Word of God and start studying it. Read it, but also study it. Take the time to sit down and study it and learn it. You, you know, it's like we were talking earlier. You ever, you've been someplace that's familiar. You've been there a lot of times. And suddenly, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't see that before. You know, yesterday I was reading Lamentations 3. I got to go back and reread Lamentations 3. There were some verses in there that just jumped out at me yesterday. And I've read that book a lot of times. But it was like, whoa, wait a minute. God opened my eyes to it at that particular point in time. Truly amazing. In Jesus, we have the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. In Colossians 2, 3, it says, In Him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There you go. It's right there. It's in God's Word. Also, the treasures we receive of righteousness. Isn't that a treasure? We receive the treasure of grace and the treasure of peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I think these are wonderful treasures. You know what, what, what saddens me is I saw yesterday's news that a young man had killed himself. He had, his family was famous, probably had all the money in the world he could ever possibly want, which is what most people are after. You know, no doubt had some degree of notoriety being who he was, and yet he took his life. Wow. What he would have given for peace. The peace of Jesus Christ. That's the answer. That's the answer right there. He gives us these treasures. 
You see, so what did, why did the man hide the treasure that's in this story? Well, we've seen the practical reasons. You see, what well, reason he hid it was that Satan desires to come and steal the word and the joy from us. Even as, if you go back and look at an earlier parable, even as the bird stole the seed in the parable of the sower. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to remove your joy. Think about it. He can't have your soul, but he can remove your joy. And that's what he wants to do. So what's the solution? Psalms 119.11 has a solution. Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Wow, isn't that a wonderful verse? We take God's word and we hide it in our hearts because it is the treasure. We hide it there. And that way we can have it when we need it so that we don't sin against God. So, you know, so what's really, what's the point of the story? Well, the point of the story is the, it's the disciples' story, but it's also our story. You see, for them, they gave up the lesser wealth of the world in order that they might have the greater wealth that comes through a knowledge of through Jesus Christ. And you know what? That's the challenge for each and every one of us. Yes, the world has some wealth. Yes, it'll offer you the possibility of fame and fortune. After all, Satan, he doesn't tempt a drug addict by showing him what it's going to be like when he overdoses. He doesn't tempt you know, somebody smoking cigarettes with, with what their lungs are going to look like in 30 years or when they get emphysema or an alcoholic with cirrhosis. But instead, you know, he shows them, hey, it's going to be great right now. The world has that immediate wealth. But you know what? In the long run, it goes away, doesn't it? Think about, think about the wealthy. They may have all the money in the world. They can buy anything. It's no big deal to them. But you know what? The moment they pass from this life, the wealth doesn't do them any good anymore. It's the lesser wealth. But instead, Jesus told the disciples, called the disciples to give up that lesser wealth in order that they might inherit the greater wealth. Why? Because they have, they're going to have treasure in, in heaven. We have treasure in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we should be striving for. You know, we, we, can, we can accumulate worldly wealth. You know, you may be gifted at the stock market and can build a great fortune there. But you know what? Once again, the economy can go bad. Things can go wrong. Hey, I can speak from my own experience. Planted some great orange groves, beautiful orange groves. Been made good money out of those orange groves. And then do, 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 here comes a freeze, kills the trees. Or boo, 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 here comes the disease, lethal greening, and kills all the trees. And guess what happened? All that went to nothing. Just literally in just a short period of time. The lesser wealth. That's what happens to it. You see, we, so we are to strive for that greater wealth. You see, a man who is not interested in spiritual things finds the greatest treasure of all when he finds Jesus Christ. May not be interested in it, but then he finds it all of a sudden. I've got a cousin that's, that's, that's a great Jess Page. I hope you're watching this. Uh, he, he, he is a great preacher and he is a great witness for Jesus Christ. He's always sharing the gospel of Christ and talking about you know, these people that he just randomly meets, how they'll come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Man, these people weren't interested in that when they run into him. I know one guy I saw on there was you know, helping him to take a cart out at Walmart. And he talked to him. The guy accepted Jesus Christ in the parking lot at Walmart. He did. When he pushed, started pushing that cart out the door, he didn't know he was going to find the greatest treasure of all. You see, the man, he exchanged the lesser wealth and instead obtained the greatest treasure of all, which is Jesus Christ. And that's the challenge for each and every single one of us. Let's bow our head in prayer. And dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. Lord, I ask you now to be with us during the remainder of this week. Give us, give us your wisdom. Give us your opportunity to, to be a light to those who are in need, Father, in the world, that they too might obtain that greater treasure. And Lord, for those who are suffering illness, we pray for their healing for them, Father. And Father, for those who have lost loved ones, we pray for them as well. Be with us now and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.